Hi, this is Paul. I know the topics for my videos are a mystery to most of you. It's The whole process is a bit of a mystery to me. Uh, there are times when I am just brimming with videos and I have five videos at once and no time to make them and so none of them come out. And there are other times when it's like, okay, I've got an hour to make a video. What shall I make it about? And I, I even take notes of those times when I have five and it's just a very weird thing. Often videos get made on topics that have sort of been in the back of my mind for a while. I first watched this video, Wisdom in, I first watched this video on Ken Lowry's channel, Climbing Mount Sophia, and it was a really good conversation about AI with John Verveke, Jonathan Peugeot, um, DC Schindler, and Ken Lowry. Uh, the first half of the video is just John and Jonathan kind of going back and forth. The video starts with a really strong, defining, the whole video is excellent, and I'm just listening to a little bit of it again, I want to listen to the thing again. I know at the Chino conference, John talked a lot about AI. Jonathan, in a number of places, was like, "Oh, I've got to talk. I've got to talk to John about AI." AI has sort of been in the background. Given all of the talk about, okay, what on earth do we mean by spirit? Why use? Why use the nomenclature of spirit? Jordan Peterson, you'll find it in the videos that he does where he touches on religious things, will now commonly use spirit. He'll name principalities and powers. Uh, we talk about distributed cognition. We talk about hyper objects. And so, you know, part of the back of my mind is, okay, we avoided talking about spirits when... Uh, in sort of the peak modernity, then we talked about, we used psychological terms, basically. Recently on the video that I did on Hermes, someone left a terrific comment talking about his daughter that has anorexia. And I thought, boy, what an interesting illustration of a spirit, because there are these, and again, we use other words for them, there are these social contagions that pass through suicide. There's a, a suicide can be contagious, and there are well-documented episodes in history of that. Uh, anorexia, uh, cutting, it seems, and again, there's plenty of evidence in psychological journals that women in particular, young women in particular, are incredibly susceptible to certain kinds of social contagions. Now, what is the why would we sort of, when you say social contagion, uh, reductive, reductive materialists won't sort of flinch. But if you say a spirit, mm, see the difficulty that they have, and this is why I usually use the example of school spirit, is that I've found no one who will debate school spirit. And there are all sorts of sort of scaffolding ways to get there. You can find Sam Harris talk about the intersubjective. Oh, that's nice. What exactly is between people? What are those actually things? And what they are, in fact, are, of course, relationships. And relationships have instantiation in matter and, and all of this stuff. So this, this has been a big, a big topic within our conversations. The other day I got, well, I can grab it here, it's here in my office. The other day I received the banner, which is the monthly publication of the Christian Reformed Church, and I just looked at the cover, and I paged through it, and I, I thought about how topics have become major points of division. If you watch news from different political vantage points, the collective cognition... See, spirits just work easier. The collective cognition of the two sides says, this is relevant, this is relevant. So you have relevance realization. You have two warring, you have two warring spirits. And part of how their relevance realization is being worked, is being displayed, are the topics of what they say are important. I remember back in the run-up to the 2016 election, and I remember when Donald Trump started going on about a wall for the border. And I remember I was watching a fair amount of um, mass media news 
during those days. And I remember people from the mostly left-leaning media talking about, oh, how stupid it was of Donald Trump to be talking about immigration because nobody's paying attention to immigration. Surely immigration is an important topic, but nobody's really talking about it. And yet Donald Trump comes out and talks about a wall. And of course, that's 2014, 2015. We all know the history that happened and in fact is still going on. In other words, the relevance realization by a spirit of mass media with a particular political equation said, these are the topics that the nation should focus on. And this connects with the combinatorial explosiveness conversation that at any given time, there's any number of things we might be able to focus on, but the distributed cognition of a certain element of society they work together and health care is what is important. So say we all. Yuck, yuck, yuck. I have been colonized by that silly branding that they have made of me on Grim Grizz's channel. This is where I'm getting to AI. John Verveke, well, we should we should probably begin where he where he talks here about this because I think he, he lays down some really good stuff, sort of as uh, this has been one of John's real gifts of precision and clarity and definition, because when he raises that, we can sort of all get on the same page. Computer understood abstractly. Um, we human beings, and they had machines. Let's start. To get this together. Yeah. Um, so I'm very happy to be here with all of you and yeah. see you all. It's great to see you too, Ken. Should I start then? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, AI, of course, artificial intelligence, a project actually proposed in the scientific revolution by Thomas Hobbes. So it's an old idea, um, and, but uh, I, I want to make use of a distinction made by John Searle between weak AI and strong AI. Weak AI is we, when we make machines that do things that used to be done by human beings. So if you're back in the 1930s, computers were human beings. You sent, if you needed computation done, you sent it down to the third floor where all the computers were, and they were human beings, and they had machines and slide rules and things like that. And of course, they have been replaced, uh, or your bank teller has been replaced by the ATM. That's called weak AI because it is not claimed that that AI gives us any scientific insight into the nature of intelligence. It's just we put together a machine. It took great intelligence, and I'm not demeaning people that do this. It's a it's a valuable, and our lives are depending on uh, weak AI. Right now, we wouldn't be talking without it. So I'm not here besmirching that and uh, anything like that. But nobody is claiming that when they're making that machine, well, now we understand, right, what cognition is or something like that. Uh, and strong AI is... Hobbes's proposal that cognition is computation um, and that what we can do is if we make the right kind of computer understood abstractly, um, we won't we will have created an instance of genuine intelligence. So it's it's not a claim of simulation. I, I always I always think when I do this that I'm just gonna let this play and I'm gonna refill my water bottle and I'm not gonna have anything I want to interrupt with because this is so good and there's nothing that I'm disagreeing with. On this other video where Chad launched a not estuary, estuary meeting, which was absolutely fantastic to listen to, um, D. Dodd, who's a regular here on the channel, you know, made the comment about, well, Jordan Hall was talking, I never understand anything he says, and then Sam, Sam Tiedemann, then rephrased what he said, no, then I could understand it. So I'm not saying that about John here, it's just... John is emphasizing, I think, what was what a lot of people, what is implicit with a lot of people in terms of the meaning crisis and the reduction of human beings, let's say the the reduction of human beings to, let's say, algorithms. That all we are, and we think of algorithms, we prob probably sort of imaginative, imaginatively think about, let's see, maybe we go down to a calculator and maybe after that we can go down to an abacus. And even an abacus is too. It's computation. It's just running enough numbers. That's that's what we will be reduced to. And in many ways, as they talk in this video, and as John had an excellent conversation also with Sam Tiedemann on Transfigured, and then I think John posted on his channel as well, 
any secret sauce. And so that that's where um, <laughs> to woo or not to woo, that is the question. There's there's something that we can't get beneath. Now, Jordan, when he was on that Catholic channel talking about Tammy, basically said there's at some point where you get low enough that it's just mystery. And so it's a floor. And so you you might have the imagination of a, a god of the gaps. And what science does is keeps pushing the floor down. But of course, if you're looking down at it, there's no way to know if it's just keep going to go down, if in fact it's bottomless, or if you can only see so far because of the limitations that you are, or in other, in other words, the... This gets to another conversation. Boy, Sam has really been having some great conversations on his channel. Another conversation with Drew Johnson about the nature of infinity. Because, and that sort of gets into the conversation between complicated and complex. And, and so often when people sort of put those next to each other, they'll say that the complex is, is mysterious or limitless. But it's sort of like using the word infinity when in fact there are multiple senses of the word infinity and by nature of our finitude infinity is something like a placeholder for something that we cannot fathom or get to the bottom of if we're going to use that language so the reduction of cognition to computation is how john puts it but it has everything to do with the question of well what exactly is our nature um, uh, it's a claim of instantiation. Now, in between weak AI and strong AI is something that's trying to move from weak AI to strong AI, and this is known as AGI, artificial general intelligence. And this is the idea that our intelligence is different from the intelligence of the ATM in that we have general intelligence. We can solve multiple problems in multiple domains for multiple reasons and multiple contexts and yada, yada, yada. You can just do the multiples, uh, which makes us uh, tremendously different from those machines. And the project is, can we get um, artificial intelligence to be artificial general intelligence? Because that will have moved the needle considerably towards strong AI um, because uh, it will become increasingly difficult to say it doesn't have uh, this sorry this is the argument it will become increasingly difficult for us to say it doesn't have the same kind of intelligence as Ken does if it can solve a wide variety of problems in a wide variety of domains for a wide variety of goals etc cetera, etc cetera. that's the basic argument whether or not AGI it, AGI is clearly necessary for strong artificial intelligence whether it's sufficient is part of what's actually being debated not very well i would say in general right now but that's what's going on okay first of all any questions just about these distinctions now to give a little spoiler alert here in some ways and this is this is the argument that people's religions that word is tough People's professed confessional religions are significant in terms of the shaping of the rest of their worldview. Jonathan Peugeot basically is going to argue, he, he's going to stand on a couple of things. Number one, when it comes down to this, is are human beings reducible to cognition? No, sorry, computation. Are human beings reducible to computation? Or is there a secret sauce? Is there, is, does, has God placed eternity in our hearts and that eternity is bottomless? And so, and again, you don't have to answer that definitively. You can answer that pragmatically. And I don't mean that in the sense that probably most of you are thinking about. It. I mean it in the terms of, it doesn't matter It, it, it doesn't matter whether you say, I can bottom out a human being with computation if you simply don't have enough lifetime to actually do it. Then it's simply an article of faith. We see that all this all the time. You see this in the eschatology of atheists, in the eschatology of believers in technology, that 
All human things, all human problems are going to be solved. It's just a matter of time of the combination of the human spirit and technology and us. Well, there are a lot of people skeptical about that. Again, Jordan Hall has been having a big footprint in the corner lately with all of the conversations that people have been battering him with. I, I warn people, I've got some other, some new randos both in the membership section and out in, that are coming to the regular section of the channel. And I warn them, I say, you know, when you come in my channel, there'll be a, there'll be a series of people who are going to ask to talk to you after me. And think about what you want to do with that. I'd, I'd love for you to do it because I love watching how other people interact with these people that come into the channel and come into the corner. But whenever I hear atheists or reductive materialists get eschatological in terms of some, some telos or some utopia, I'm always skeptical. And what's, what amazes me and what I... I receive with a bit of chagrin is that uh, your world does your your worldview doesn't really afford that. You are um, trying to pass checks that your worldview account cannot cover. Because to say this will be solved by technology is simply an article of faith. Even if you say faith is knowledge without evidence or some such really bad definition like that. So anyway, Jonathan Peugeot, because of his worldview, basically says what we're seeing with AI is on one hand always recycled from human beings. It's it's sort of like soil and green. If you don't if you're not old enough to know that reference, just Google it. Um, soil and green is people. Uh, AI is people. And and I'm quite persuaded by Jonathan's comments on this, on that, because in some ways the argument that we can develop strong AI means we can develop something that sort of is not dependent on us. And of course, there's the plot of many scientific science fiction movies. I'm quite skeptical about John Verveke's ideas about training little gods on one hand, but on the other hand, what I see us doing is already sort of that. And we've already been doing this with, in other words, both are sort of correct. And that when you look at, let's say, what human, what we've done with people in mythology, having Pharaoh be a god and having Caesar be a god and having Alexander be a god and what we do with basketball players and football players and actors and musicians. We are already using technology to create gods. So the fact that we might ramp up other kinds of technologies and turn them into gods, well, yeah. And so then John Verveke's point is about the training of these gods, that we have to give them morality and ethics and caring and all of those things because we're so good at that we're not so good at that <laughs> and the difficulty that we face is that what we wind up doing with technology tends to be magnifying our power and also often pushing ourselves beyond where it is wise and our own wisdom with respect to it. I can't find the moment in the video, but this is uh, Sam's conversation with Jordan. And, and they, both, they both touch on the fact that part of what we have seen and in human technology and our use of it is that we use technology in unwise ways. Our technological capacity outstrips our capacity for wisdom. This whole conversation, again, there there has been so much good stuff produced lately, and Jordan's conversation with Sam is is just outstanding in terms of all of the topics that they that they really get into. Uh, we lately I've been thinking about the fact that 
what we have been doing in the corner, it's not technically AI. What we've been doing is using this technology to de develop a learning community. One of the most interesting places in the corner for me lately has been Chad's channel. Chad, I, I don't know how Chad has managed to do everything that he's managed to do while being a faithful churchman, while being a faithful husband, while giving his time and attention to AA and the important work that Alcoholics Anonymous does, and keeping his business going as a tiler and making videos. It's just alarming the, the amount of stuff he has produced. And in fact, he is launching all sorts of new shows besides just sort of the little tidbit shows that he's done and reaction videos that he does and pondering videos that he does. He had, oh, he, he had a video, I don't even remember which one it was, he had a video last week that I thought, boy, that deserves an entire commentary video. And I didn't have time to do it. And then he recently had a conversation, the Friday morning meandering show, where he talks to Neil. And Neil has, has really impressed me as someone with a lot of wisdom and insight. And he's bringing a lot of value to the corner. And his, I, I downloaded his two-plus-hour conversation with Neil that I listened to while I was in Costco last week or just a few days ago, and there's so much good stuff in there about faith and story and T-Grog and noticing the corner, how much we've learned and where we've grown. And I've seen this in Chad. You know, Chad will regularly sort of portray himself as kind of a dummy. He is by no means a dummy. But he does not have all of the education that a number of us have had, or all of the years that, say, someone like myself or John Verveke has had, or a lot of the opportunities that a number of us has have had. He spent most of his life surviving and then getting clean and sober and then getting married and then putting a career under him. And now he's, and what he's done over the last few years is listen to just about everything that this corner plus other things have produced and having been watching him for years now, I can see growth. I can see that, I mean, initially he was just sort of playing around with things, but that's what you do. You play around with things. And now when I watch him play around with things, I can see the insight and I can see the development and I can see everything that he's producing. And to me, when I look at Chad and when I look at Neil, and then one of the things that Chad did today was do this online estuary session he was a little nervous about it. he didn't want to upset john van donk who keeps saying estuary isn't online well it can be online too and what was interesting about the selection of the people on there is these are basically this is basically a uh, this little corner all-star team in terms of the rising stars of the corner now they're not all on there because there are more than this but over the last number of months of course i knew tayo before christian baxter has come on strong with his channel he just had Jordan Hall and his channel, and I was, I'm about a third of the way into it, and also, and it's a great conversation. They're going in places, they're answering questions that I would like answered. Of course, Chris McDonald came on with Waves of Obsession. Neil Daedalus is on. Pete has been working Strange Theology. Uh, Sourdough Neil, I know him probably the least of the group. Diane, uh, she's been a she's been in this corner right from the start, and of course Chad, and. I look at the level of development and improvement. One of the things that Neil says in his long conversation with Chad is one of the interesting things when T. Grogan came into the comment section and then onto the live stream, and T. Grog is like me. He's a bit of a troll in the comments, but you get him on a camera with his face on there, and he's a super nice guy, and he's a good faith actor, and you can actually have really good productive conversations, which is something that I noticed early on in Bridges of Meaning and why... I wanted a space in which cameras were on and real faces were in front of the camera. So what I've seen is that while not AI, we have been using these tools to level up. In Jordan Hall's, in the end of Jordan Hall's conversation with Jim Rutt, 
Jordan Hall is thinking about scale and the Dunbar numbers. And I just had a conversation. Oh, it's we'll have to see if it comes to the channel. I had a Randos conversation with someone today. He's a Mennonite church planter from Pennsylvania, and we just had a wonderful time together. Um, but one of the things that I told him was that you know when Jordan Hall is talking about scale and churches, I'm like, yeah, we've been the church has been working on these issues forever. And, you know, have some answers and some models, and they're all quite well studied. But this is, this, is a, this is a big, big topic. And I'm only about I'm only about an hour into this video. What's been interesting, and I think many of us in the corner have noticed this, in terms of paying attention to my attention, as the corner has grown, more and more of my attention tends to be focused within the corner. Now, that's difficult. And as a pastor, I'm used to that because as a pastor, on one hand, I have to pay attention to the flock that I'm working on within the church, but I always have to look outside the church because things coming outside the church are coming to the flock. And so it's always a matter of balancing those two things. The beautiful thing about the collective cognition that we have going here is that there are way more people looking outside and with this distributive cognition and collective cognition that we have going on and paying enough attention to each other, if we can get the balance right, we will be asking questions that that are coming up into this. That, 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 didn't, that wasn't phrased well. I saw a video about uh, Notebook LM, a new Google product that has been given. It's, it's, sort, it's supposedly a note-taking app. Now, Google, I was burned on Google Notebooks years ago, and I'm a little shy about investing in another one of your products because I know your track record. I'm talking to you, Algo. But basically, it's the promise of, well, you can sort of, Google is giving you a way to sort of construct your own large language model on Google's dime. And, you know, they have protections in there that this is private and yours. And, yeah, I, I don't really believe that. But notice how scalable this is getting. Uh, Marquise Brownlee just recently did a video on Sora, I believe that's the name of it, which is ChatGPT's video engine. So Marquise is basically talking about how good these videos are getting and how they used to they used to have this video which was which was uh, let's go back. used to have videos which was which were like oh so there's the new ones yeah that's what they used to look like and you know if you watch very carefully you can tell the difference but they're they're getting incredibly real And so in some ways, this little corner has become an organic large language model, only way smarter and way better. In, in that sense, there's sort of an AI race between the collective us and the machines that is already underway. And what we've sort of put together, together, and the sort of delightful and sort of scary thing, which sort of ratifies Peugeot's comments, is that we've done this without noticing. Neil Daedalus asks a really important question, which was why I queued it up to this point. Is it Satan attracting me? Is it? And the question I keep going back to is, is this space making my faith stronger or weaker? Is, and, and that's, the, and I, well, I said earlier, I'm, I'm just really excited about bottom-up ecumenicism. I'm, I'm, ex, I'm excited to talk. I'm, I'm excited to smuggle Jesus with fellow <laughs> Jesus smugglers. I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, and But do so in a fun, joyous way. And, and I, you know, so I think about what the church is going to be 50, 100, 200 years from now and, and what... Um, uh, the other the other guy, uh, Jordan, uh, who was the guy in Grail Country on Saturday who talked about we're an infant stage uh, Christianity. Like, we don't know what Christianity. Who, who is it? 
Jordan, Jordan Daniel Wood. That's it. The, the other Jordan. So many Jordans. Uh, yeah. But like, we don't know what that's going to be like in in a thousand years, two thousand years. We have no idea. And uh, I think that also ties into Chad's confessions. Like, we have some brilliant minds in this space. And I, I describe this space as like, I am average weirdness and I'm average intellect in this space. <laughs> like, and my wife's like, that's that's a pretty cool space. I'm like, I know it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so the appearance of the spirit in the corner and what is the church? Love to talk about it. Thank you, Neil. And then they'll talk about, you know, the continuing evolution of our definition of spirit and the relationship between Holy Spirit and the other spirits. One of the one of the best things about the estuary protocol and what it can do. Now, I've got an estuary meeting here at church tonight that I'm really looking forward to. I, I always look forward to estuary. Now, there's no live stream. This comes out on Friday morning. There's no live stream this Friday morning because I have to do my rough draft. And I, get, I have to get my church work done. Then I have to get on an airplane and then I'm flying up to Portland. And then I'm going to I have a I'm doing that for a church meeting tomorrow. But when I fly to another part of the country, and I can get access to a church, basically asking a favor. And I know that there are people in the Portland area and in the Washington area. And I say, let's do an estuary. And, and part of the reason that I sort of grab onto the estuary protocol is that I know it works. I know this estuary protocol can take eight or ten total strangers, if need be, put them in a room and have a really satisfying conversation. Now, this is in some ways built up, sort of like a large language model that I'm sure is behind Google Notebook LM. Because another thing that I was thinking about when I was watching this conversation is how, and this is both gratifying and terrifying, how I have managed to colonize people in all sorts of different church and unchurch backgrounds. Because, I mean, they're not, I'm not making anybody watch my videos, but it's not just me, of course, it's John Verveke and it's Jonathan Peugeot, and then increasingly it's each other and the conversations that they're having, but we are upping our game in dis terms of distributed cognition. And, you know, there are rightly good questions to ask with respect to it, but... My sense is that this is, in fact, a good thing, and people are, people's lives are improved. They are coming to faith. We'll have to see. We're spending a lot of screen time, and that's a, that's a cautionary thing. But this is this is what's happening now, at least to the degree that we can see it. And it isn't artificial intelligent. This in in sort of a Jonathan Peugeot way. This is bootstrapped our intelligent. And these are rather dumb tools. They are single-use tools. Zoom. I don't do my taxes on Zoom. I don't um, order my groceries on Zoom. I just talk to each other on Zoom. But we are sort of stretching what even dumb tools like the YouTube algorithm can do. And there is a, there is a, I don't know that intelligence is the right word, but there's an aspect of that that we are using it for. And it seems to be for good. And in fact, in this day when we are, they rightly note in that video that, you know, part of the irony of all of these tools is it might make all of these screens useless because very quickly we won't be able to believe anything that we see on these screens. Yet, part of the beauty of a network of randos, as opposed to, let's say, just simply a compilation of stars and celebrities is that while there's probably motivation to make a fake Jordan Peterson and perhaps increasing motivation to make a fake Jonathan Peugeot and John Verveke, we're probably a little ways from the motivation to make a fake PVK. And as we go on down into our level of distributed cognition and community and fellowship, um, yeah, are we going to fake everyone here? Part of the thing with me is I'm so bad at, let's say, constancy of personal grooming. And what I mean by that is not that I don't shower. No, I shower. I bathe. I do not, I do not smell bad, at least to the best of my knowledge. But my beard is always untrimmed, and sometimes it's long, and sometimes it's short, and sometimes the hair on my head is here, and 
So any AI is going to have to deal with that. And I also thought this morning how any AI is going to have to deal with all of my unfinished sentences. So when you hear a PVK not interrupting himself, not stuttering, not doing all of the things that when I watch myself, it really annoys me and think, oh, good grief, man, you've been speaking English all these years. Haven't you learned how to do it? You are you communicate professionally. Can't you keep your ADHD-addled brain on one track long enough to make any sense? Well, Mr. AI, that's going to be your challenge because my guess is either you'll be way too divergent like we see in these large language models or way too linear. So that's the good news. Let's look at something else. So about the same time, the Verveke, Peugeot, Schindler AI conversation came out, this video came out. And, you know, when I think about AI, I think about, you know, the little thing that Microsoft is now going to put on all of our keyboards and Bing chat and mid journey for thumbnails and, you know, now Google notebook LM language model. I guess that's what LM stands for. And, and I think about all of those things. And I guess, you know, when I heard Jordan Peterson at the event in Sacramento talk about pornography and people are already having sex with machines. And when I hear, you know, every, every year or so, the sex robots topic sort of colonizes YouTube again. And when you have these, um, these companionship apps that people want to take to do the sexy talk with one another. But then I watched this video. Now there's no nipples or anything like that in this video, but this, this shocked me. For a while now, which is a little frustrating for me, but oh, by the way, one of the really fun episodes I'm gonna do while she's not with us, because I've been meaning to do this forever as an episode, but I haven't gone to it, is I want to do a review. And if you ever wanna join me on this, this could be fun to do, of all of the AI porn websites. These two must have a very secure marriage because if I told my wife, honey, I'm gonna do a review of all AI porn websites and I'm going to do this with an OnlyFans girl. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that wouldn't go s over so well. But anyway, Malcolm, good luck with that. Um, have you looked Ooh. into any of these? Not recently. I did like a, like a year or two ago, but that's like a decade in AI timelines. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, sorry. Before we get further on the intro, I just got to tell you about these because they're really interesting. Yeah. So they typically right now seem to fall into like one of three categories. One is a category of AI sites that like nudes photos of women. Like, so anyone who you're friends with, you can submit your photos to them. I was going to try it with photos of my wife. Now, I don't know what he means by, Malcolm, I don't know what you mean by that. <sighs> Call me old fashioned. I, I assume I, I I don't even know I don't even I don't even know what I I don't even know what to think about that. Like one morning, I actually got interesting and I started submitting photos to my wife to see what what she would look like. So I'm gonna keep it wholesome <laughs> if I do. Another one, what yeah. they do is you choose specific profiles of women, um, but they're like a a like. A, a cat girl meets you at a stream in like this fantasy world, or like you have an elf girl as like a slave or whatever, you know, right? Like, and you can chat with these individuals and then you can ask for photos of these individuals in specific contexts. And, and already I'm like, oh yeah, I'm getting really terrified by AI. I mean, as long as AI is sort of helping me do thumbnails yeah, that's, that's, that seems harmless. And then every now and then I bump into something which is like, oh, yeah, people will use it for this. Which is really interesting. And then the final category is creating women. So you give a set of parameters that you would like, like a woman to be, and then the AI system would create a woman that fits that set of parameters. 
and so of course if you're an old timer like me and you remember the original star trek and i'm sure you can google it you can look up i mud where basically this guy makes these women robots for his planet and then he wants off of the planet and of course the stepford wives got into this and this has been a this has been an idea but now we're getting to the point that people are, you know, they're not necessarily going to have them passing as women among us, but they're going to have them on their screens for their own private pleasures. And you can now ask for photos of this woman and chat with her. Like, I want to get your thoughts on this because I think you have interesting. Would you like to know more? You can chat with her now? Like, do they, when it's integrated with the chatting? Yeah, so it's integrated with the chatting. So they'll integrate the personality and 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 background and jobs you give her with the chat feature. Damn. Of course, I did a video about this with this one service that had this companion. And then for a while, of course, for sort of a, a premium fee, you could get sexual in your chat with this avatar that you made. And then the company suddenly got cold feet about this whole thing and shut it down. And there were a whole bunch of people that were upset because the company just sort of, um, there are lots of phrases I could use, but shut it down. That's what it, it, the company suddenly had a headache. Let's put it that way. And then you also get porn of her. Does she like sexy talk? Yeah, but you have to pay for the individual pics. So you pay for credits and then the credits get porn of her. What I was going to do if I did an episode on this is I was going to create like artificial Simones and try to like ask them for porn of them. <laughs> uh, you know, for those of you who think that I'm a pastor to everyone else on the internet, <laughs> I would not recommend any of this for any of you. Now, this isn't just sort of a cautionary tale video. There's something coming which I think is deeply telling and substantive soon. And I, I actually got bored <laughs> and tried this one morning because I was like, I want to see pictures of my wife. But like, unfortunately, the pictures... That I, 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 I just, you see, the thing is for some of you out there who don't have wives or have never been in serious relationships, and I'm going to mention a whole math video pretty soon for whom women are much more projection than reality, that this might not seem so shocking to you, but I really wonder how many wives out there, and I'm sure they're out there, would be okay to say, honey, you sleep in. I'm going to open up my computer, but don't worry. All of the porn that I indulge in while you're getting the rest of your sleep is porn of you. And they're going to right away say, but is it me? Because what I really want you to be is connected to me. And, and so, you know, when you look at home math, which is just sort of trying to help people in the very early stages of getting together, if you've been with someone for decades, oh, there's a lot that goes on. So now, and of course, Malcolm and Simone are not newlyweds. Um, you know, they're working on, I think they're working on child number four. They gave me, did not look enough like her and I got sad and left. Yeah, I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think we'll, we'll be there soon. Once now, Ayla is, I mean, Ayla's backstory is, is obviously noteworthy. She is not, oh gosh, how to talk about this stuff. And, and these are all real people. And so... Let 
let's just keep going. Once we're there, it's going to be incredible. You can just like have custom wife porn all the time. Right? When she's not up in the morning yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. How about when she's not up in the morning and she's pregnant and you say, well, I just can't be bothered. I'm just take care of it yourself. Yeah. How, how long is that going to last? And what really does that do to the marriage? Yeah, and I can go online because that's what I'm when I was doing this. I was like, oh, I want to talk with my wife, but she's not up yet. Can I create like an AI simulacra of her to talk to? No. Now, if you watch Ayla, she's listening carefully. She's listening well. She's doing, I don't know. I don't know the woman, but my guess is she's doing a little bit of masking, which is what we all do when we politely listen and we give little clues that we understand and we're following the conversation. Yes, she's she's clearly a skilled listener, a clearly a skilled communicator. But what is she thinking about this? Because this is particularly interesting in her case because she is someone who has used the machines to reproduce herself to earn money and fame and all of these things. But that's done something to her. And this is the thing about you know, even with what we're doing on this corner with us all on videos, this does something to us. And I'm still doing it and I don't plan to stop, but we ought we ought not to just sort of skate over those thoughts too. Well, what are uh, different ways you think AI will be used in the in the sex industry? Other I mean, than I don't know. Videos? I mean, I recently I've been seeing photos of me around the internet with different faces on me, which is upsetting. And they're probably... Photos of her body with different faces, which is upsetting. Well, why is it upsetting? There's, there's, the internet is doing a degree of disassociation, taking, removing her from her body, dissociative, you know, victims of abuse, victims of trauma often dissociate. They, 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 they self-transcend to get out of pain and then they will spend time dealing with the trauma of, of what that meant. Just using like face up for this right now, but it's probably going to become an AI thing pretty shortly. Where it's just like use Ayla's body as a template. And I'm a little offended by it. Actually, I want to ask you about offense questions. So there was something that Simone said she'd find offensive, but I was like, it's kind of flattering in a way. So there was a guy in Japan or Korea. Okay, and before we get to the instance, and this is just it. You go to home math and the entire premise of the channel is men and women are different. We approach the world in very different ways. And when it comes to sexuality, it is a big deal. And if, if you have been in a relationship, an intimate relationship like a marriage for multiple decades, you begin to understand just how complex this whole thing is. And then you throw in all of these issues and it's like, oh, man. Korea or something who his wife ended up divorcing him because he would hire prostitutes that looked like her when she was younger. And I was like, that's kind of flattering. What are your thoughts on that? Would you find that offensive? Any of you who are married, just imagine the scenario. And, and again, they're human beings. It's a pretty diverse bunch in many, many different ways. There'll be some of you out there that have surprising answers to this question. But I would dare say easily the majority if you go to your wife and say, Honey, you know... I, I want to relieve you of the burden of my um, of my sexual needs, and so what I've decided to do is hire a prostitute. But don't worry, I'm going to find one that looks a lot like you when you were younger. <laughs> You'd either better have the car running, or be wearing a suit of armor, or be be faster than your wife out the door, because um, yeah, that ain't going to go well in most cases. I, I mean, I'd probably find it painful. <laughs> like, it's painful well, to I not... I guess it highlights that you're older now, right? Yeah, it's painful to, like, be... Oh, not just that. That's that's just the beginning. 
losing out on sexual access because your physicality is not sufficiently attractive. That's like a quite painful thing. And, you know, part of the thing that I, when I listen to Ayla, you, you get the sense that women who have made a career out of satisfying at least to some level men have had to, well, they really understand male sexuality probably in a very deep way, but there's been a sacrifice of female sexuality to do it because part of what makes sex difficult and sometimes sort of bottomless in the way that I was talking about in terms of cognition are the differences. What a topic. Mm. Well, okay. So then you, you having other women with their face on your body, what specifically is triggering a negative emotional reaction around this? I don't know. It's, I don't normally, normally like the thing that you're worried about is like somebody taking your face and putting it on a nude so people can imagine you naked, but it's like yeah. your identity. But this is like somehow the reverse. It's like, it's my body, but like I'm erased out of it in some way. And that feels like shockingly dehumanizing in a way I didn't expect. I mean, I just I didn't expect people to do In a way I didn't expect. And that's, that's when it comes to AI, that's sort of the terrible thing that because of the reality of the world and because of our limited, because of combinatorial explosiveness, we can only take in a tiny little portion of the world and therefore we can only anticipate a tiny little portion of the world. You can go back to Sam Tiedemann and, and Jordan Hall's conversation about the meta crisis, which can, you know, that can be a scary conversation. And what we've seen with technology is there are so many ways this stuff goes that we can't anticipate. Do this at all. I'm like, what the hell is the motivation? It, or I don't know. Because well, like, the motivation maybe... is that they want these other people naked, right? They want sexual access to someone who's not you. Yeah, well, I'm not even sure. They want novelty, right? Sure, it was a real face. It wasn't even like a person. It was just like a generic face that wasn't mine. And so that they could like sit, do it and like sort of steal it without it getting credit to me or something. Oh, so it's an intellectual property asked um, issue. Well, not just that, but there's that dimension too. And then they would upload them. Oh, that's, oh, that's. Yeah, so like people weird. reporting like, hey, is this you? Like, this is your body? It's just like a generic. It wasn't a person. It was just. And, and even that hearing from others. And so in other words, There are enough people out there watching all of this stuff that they're watching this and saying, I recognize that body, but it's got a... Di I mean, I... I... And I'm like, that is... If that was me, God damn it! You're like erasing my identity from a thing. It's almost like something that plagiarizes your work somehow. Yeah, well, no, it is. Well, it, it, so so I didn't actually finish the intro here because I got so sidetracked by Sorry. interesting talk about pornography. <laughs> so Ayla is, you know, I was actually thinking today, and I was trying to think: is there another? Because I've written a book on sexuality, a best-selling book on sexuality, The Pragmatist Guide to Sexuality. Check it out. It sells for like ninety-nine cents. It's really good. Through the ebook, I have a couple yeah. copies. Yeah, I say you like it. Yeah. So Ayla, as somebody who like is deeply interested in this field, I was thinking you are probably the best sexual researcher in human history. And then I was thinking, does Kinsey beat you? And I was like, not really. Kinsey is more like the Freud of human sexual research. He is important because he has Now, I know a number of you just scoffed. And I'm not about to try to footnote his claim, because I have no idea. But this is the corner in which we are looking at the other three Ps. And so when it comes to, you, if you include the other three Ps, you have to give points for experience. Because it's one thing to study this as a grad student or in some psych lab. It's a whole other thing to participate in it. The difficulty, of course, is that, yeah. And she goes on later to talk about the fact that as, you know, 
she she understands that she is aging and she understands that you know she no longer does the kinds of things she used to do when she needed money more now she has a degree of status and she has other irons in the fire and is able to sort of move laterally and do other things because she knows that she's not going to be able to uh, capitalize quite literally on her on her youth and so she is going to have to develop other aspects of herself to be able to succeed in the world but so hey fair enough i mean a lot of my criticisms are like how short-sighted are you and you know very smart woman but if i'm gonna if i'm gonna talk about the points with respect to the other three p's we have to also ask points with respect to wisdom and the whole complex thing that's that's enough that's that's enough of this video to give you a sense of I was thinking about AI and I was thinking about all these things and then I keep an eye on their channel and then this came up and I thought, oh, oh, oh. And, and of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And then this gets back to Peugeot's point because Peugeot's point is that, again, number one, this stuff is going to be derivative. And connecting that with the other video, the, de the derivation is going to be costly for people. We are going to have to harvest aspects of human beings to feed the machines, even though part of this is that the machines... Are, are there to sort of replicate and duplicate us, but to what degree do we wish to be replicated and duplicated? Of course, John Verveke started that out talking about um, computers, uh, men and women who are particularly good at mathematical calculations, and they worked in doing mathematical calculations in rooms, and then, of course, they were replaced by calculators and computers, and even Grim Grizz, again, you go back to his story, he used to work in medical transcription. And transcription is one of those jobs that has been quite quickly replaced by machines. A few years ago, there was all sorts of panic about truck drivers being replaced by machines. Um, one of the things that we see is that, on one hand, many of these things progress quicker than we imagine. On the other hand, the world is deeper. This again, back, some people are like, that combinatorial explosive stuff is all made up. Oh, really? Why don't we have self-driving cars? Because even just getting your car down the road is combinatorially explosive. And that brings me to this whole math video that I've played before. And I really love, I used it before in sort of connection with autism, but this is in connection with, okay, so, so we're going to, people are going to start using, it, yeah. people are just going to start using, are, are going to start harvesting from us and putting it in the machine to, to put out things. And we already have issues, part of, part of, what makes us so good at, at collective cognition is in fact this capacity that that Homath notices and when he when he made the video with his little pen thing I thought that's a genius way of showing it because I understand clearly I mean I, I, I always sort of knew it but it was this moment in which oh now I see it clearly and that's sort of the genius of his channel even though I think in some ways it continues to be limited. As a kid, I didn't really get music. I'm different. So I just looked at what other people were listening to. I saw my sister listening to all these goofy love songs. And I said, why would you want to listen to some guy you don't know sing to some girl you don't know? And she said, there is no other girl. So I... See right there. And this is, again, Miguel Christ, right brain, left brain. There is no other girl. We already play, project, play dissociative games with each other in our minds. 
And, and what this technology is going to do is sort of strengthen all of that. I went, oh, okay. She's listening in the second person as if he's singing directly to her. Okay, in the second person. Now notice, when we're having all of this debate about gender versus sex, yada, 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 we, we borrowed this term, we exapted this term from grammar and began using it in a different way. When he says she's listening in the second person, we just did the same thing. And yeah, it's it's a it's a very clear, powerful communication to say, oh, she's listening in the second person. He wrote this song about Gloria, and your name might be Hilda. How do you like these oldie names that I'm picking out? Um and yeah. Uh, doesn't matter. You're just into the song. I also had a friend who listened to a lot of rap music. I swear to God he wore a do-rag with salmon-colored boating shorts. And so I said, why would you want someone to say these things to you? It, it seems really rude. And he gave me some idiot answer like, this is real life. His father was a lawyer. And of course, all this AI porn is going to be about real life. So then I come back to the corner and I think, huh. sure, I'm glad we're going to think through this together because people out there have different experiences. And, you know, I don't, I don't have to be an OnlyFans girl. Imagine me as an OnlyFans. No, 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 don't go there, you people. Don't go there. I can at least listen to somebody else's experience and learn from it. And when we do this collective cognition, I don't know what it's like to be an alcoholic. I don't know what it's like to be a Tyler. I don't know what it's like to be a deep Joe Rogan fan. I don't know what it's like to have a history of severe depression. I don't know what it's like to be a recent converse and to convert and to have all of this stuff rushing into church. I don't know what it's like to be a sourdough maker. I don't know what it's like to oh, Tayo. <laughs> I know a lot about Tayo. I mean, the thumbnail about Tayo. I mean, Tayo's life's incredible. Um, Tayo's an incredible guy. I don't know what it's like to be him. I don't know what it's like to be Christian. Of the group, probably because Christian has been a pastor, an evangelical pastor, I probably know what's more of it's like to be him than anyone else here, but if we're all thinking together and working together, we can learn from each other and we can leverage all of the experience. And that is sort of a, it's not an artificial intelligence, it's an organic intelligence and it's a human intelligence and it's how bodies think and live together. None of this is, of course, without risk. And and then the spirits we generate in, in the hands of some will go different ways. I, I caught... Um, uh, it was it was a flebus kind. It was a flebus comment on one of these that you know maybe nine out of ten for eight out of ten people or four out of five people. Let's, let's reduce our fractions for four out of five people. In terms of a religious conversion, maybe four out of five went closer towards Christianity, and one out of five moved further away. I have an excellent conversation that's probably going to stay in the membership channel on that. So yeah, I, my time is my time is up. This is your Friday video. Uh, no live stream today, and uh, leave a comment.